In our old lessons that are face-to-face, -face, we may have relied on awarding stickers to students. If they do all the work on the assignment sheet, then they receive a certain amount of stickers that serve as recognition for their work. Other extrinsic motivators that I have heard about but have not used are having a jar of candy and students select a certain number of pieces specified by the teacher. Fancy pencils that can be awarded to a student. Full-size candy bars. Who deserves that? And believe this, a can of soda pop. Virtual teaching means we have to rethink how we motivate our students, and especially those that need it. Giving praise to a student is also a great thing. I always make sure and try to focus on where the praise is going, rather than say, that's just awesome. I try to pinpoint exactly what was awesome. I noticed how steady your rhythm was in the piece today. The tonal quality of sound you gave to this piece really added to the overall concept of the piece. Just a few examples and thoughts. And setting goals, as I mentioned before, will help to a certain degree, but let's not overlook the process of learning. And that means that we don't want to rush to learn and finish a project without understanding the theory, history, and keyboard skills behind it. My last category pertains to the selection and teaching of two pieces that I would like to demonstrate for you. Again, with virtual teaching, I am planning ahead for new pieces my students will learn and trying to find even better ways of preparing the pieces with them virtually before they go and practice them. In our old teaching format of face-to-face, -face, we might have just sent a piece home with a student with no prior discussion or information. We are at their mercy when they return the next week with possible wrong notes, rhythms, etc. And by the way, we can be at mercy anytime with incorrect notes and rhythms. We have to be on top of how we present the music so the student is successful from the very beginning. I want to add that while I am presenting these pieces, many of these things I already do or did in face-to-face -face lessons. The process of how I am thinking about it and going about teaching it are what I am suggesting here. The first piece, Alberti's Music Box, comes from Succeeding at the Piano, Recital Book Grade 3 by Helen Marley. This is a late elementary level piece. Patterns are small with limited extensions for the hand. You will see that the left hand embraces the chord progression of 1, 4, and 5, 7 in the key of F major. As with nearly all educational pieces, they are either in ABA form or a hybrid AA repeated. This one features the latter form of AA. The second half is the repetition of the first with the right hand lowered one octave. My thoughts on teaching are as follows. When I prep a piece, I rarely put the piece of music in front of them. I start with some thoughtful or thought-provoking ideas like, let's warm up with an F major scale, hands together, one octave. And this is probably not a thought-provoking idea for them. Then I will ask the student to play as a review the primary chords cadences on F major, hands together. Then I want to prepare their ears by playing the chord progression for measures 1 to 4 blocked. I will reference that I am playing in 4-4 four, four time, and I will also count as I play Novel idea. One, two, three, four. Then I will ask the student what they hear. Can they tell me what chords I have played? Can they play that back to me? 
all of my students will try to play this back, by the way. They're good troopers. <laughs> I will then add the chords in measures five through six and play the complete progression from one to six. One to six. One, two, three, four. Following that, I will ask the student if they can play that back to me again. The next step is to take the chord progression in the left hand and demonstrate it in Alberti style, stressing what makes it Alberti, with an informal explanation that the pattern is bottom, top, middle, top. I will demonstrate a measure and have them play back a measure for me as well. Following this, I will demonstrate measures one through six in Alberti style. The student will be asked to listen for the chord progression again. After I am done, I will ask the student if they feel comfortable trying out what I just did. If not, I would hope and believe that at the very least, they understand the underlying sequence of chords that they will be playing. Next step. I will focus on the right hand melody using measures 9 through 10. My thought here is to have the student listen for the intervals of the melody. Rather than play the entire melody, I am going to single out the first intervals and play those first F to A. My questions to the student will be, what interval is this, a second or a third? Is it major or minor? Then work with the next interval, A to C, asking the same questions. And lastly, I will play the entire short melody from measures 9 to 10. Last step, I will ask my student to play a descending F major scale. I'm referencing measure 14. This is for closure. And very lastly, I will ask the student to now pull up the score and I play the first page for them. After the brief playthrough, I will again highlight each section and point out what we worked on to pull everything together. I feel that why this takes time, it really allows the student to listen and think about the music away from the actual score, hopefully perking their ears up even more to the music. I am confident that they can take this and learn it more efficiently and with fewer mistakes. I can also be proved wrong too. The next piece I'd like to introduce is Waltz written by Diane Ghoul, Casey, and Robbie, and comes from the Succeeding with the Masters Festival Collection, Book 3. It is for an early intermediate student and offers the same form as the previous piece, AA. Again, the student will not have the piece in front of them yet. This time, for this level of student, I will do a playthrough for the first half, measures 1 through 15. Robbie's sound is entirely different, and for some students, it presents a really new sound that they are not accustomed to. Thus, a playthrough will, at the very least, 
perk up their ears to what I call the Robbie sound. Robbie loves intervals of fourths, fifths, and sevenths. I will demonstrate various places throughout the score where you can hear these. For now, my focus is going to be on doing a bit of ear training, starting with intervals of fourths. I will target measure one, the left hand intervals. Are they a third, fourth, or a fifth? And I will do this for measures five, nine, and 13. I won't do this for you now. The student should be catching on that all of these intervals are perfect fourths. Next, back to the beginning and focusing on beat one to beat two intervals, bottom of the chord, beat one, beat two. I will ask them if they hear the same pattern. I will then move on to measures five to eight, nine to 12, and 13 to 15, and do the same thing. My question will be, do you hear same or different chords? Right hand. At this level, the student should be able to read the notes fluently. The purpose here is for me to play the first long phrase of the right hand while the student listens, and then discuss the phrase structure. We can talk about the subphrase, measures one through four, and the long-term phrase, one to eight. In addition, the playing of the right hand also needs to reflect the shape of the line and the sound that goes with it. The expectation of the student is that they should shape the line. Now the student can open the music. We can review what we went through, noticing the intervals in the left hand, the patterns of the left hand, and the phrasing of the right hand melody. In addition, it should be mentioned the overall form of the piece to remind the student that page one is page two, with a slight difference at the end. My hope is that this has prepared the student to think differently about the piece and to learn it efficiently and correctly for the next lesson. Well, this is where I have reached the end of my grab bag of ideas. I hope that some of these ideas may be helpful to any of you at any given time. I do want to thank again Dr. Kwok her supporting administrators and staff that has helped make this presentation a success on your end. I welcome questions and comments at a later date, and I wish you all well, staying safe during this interesting time. All my best to you. Again, thank you for listening today. Many thanks to Dr. Kwok again for extending this invitation.